Uh, Dan is still out of town, so uh, he has asked me to teach this morning, and he'll be back next week and, uh, to continue in, uh, in, in his classes. He asked me to teach uh, uh, about Jacob, and that's what we'll be covering this morning. And I certainly want to uh, welcome any comments, questions, or anything else during the class. As we start the class together, I really want to start from the, uh, well, for one thing, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being the three patriarchs of the nation of Israel. Uh, in the material that's covered, Jacob has more uh, written about him than Abraham and Isaac put together. Of course, one of the, one of the things about that, uh, reasons for that is, uh, so much of his life is bound up in his 12 children. Uh, 13, counting the girl. We'll cover a little bit about her, too. And uh, so there is certainly more material than what we'll have time to cover, and so I want to uh, try to get the key, the key things. You, somebody have a hand up? You can't hear it? It's on? Can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Um, as we start, I really wanted to go back to, that's a little bit loud, isn't it? Or is it? I can't tell from here. Well, anyway, I'll start and go from there. Let those guys adjust the sound. Uh, in chapter 47 of Genesis, uh, which is really towards the end of Jacob's life, Joseph has uh, uh, brought the family down to, uh, into Egypt. There's been a famine back in the land of Canaan. Uh, the brothers come down there for food. Jacob rec uh, Joseph recognizes them, and they don't recognize him. He's second in command as far as just under uh, Pharaoh. And, uh, but anyway, there's, uh, uh, as time goes on, he makes himself known, and everything is reconciled between them for the past. And uh, he brings his father back, and the whole family, about 75 people, counting uh, servants and everyone, uh, down into the land of Egypt. And Joseph brings uh, Jacob to meet Pharaoh. And uh, in uh, Genesis 47, and I'll, I'll just briefly uh, start reading from verse 7. Then Joseph brought in Jacob his father, and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of and years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days and years of my sojourn are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days and years of my life. And they have not attained unto the days and years in the life of my fathers in the days of their journey. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. It's a little bit sad that a, a man in, the, in the, his latter years uh, of his life, and this is close to, close to his end, that he looks back on his life and he sees it as one full of evil. And when he talks about his life not being as long, of course, 130 years at this point sounds kind of long to us. But uh, uh, Isaac lives to 180. And of course, the other patriarchs, many of them lived past that. So as we go through, we'll be looking at some of these things and, and that uh, Jacob's talking about as few that evil have been the years. And I think that we'll agree uh, with him that at the very least, he had a very rough life. Uh, sometimes as we, as we look at our lives and What's happened, I, most people I've ever talked to talking about their lives, they'll say, well, I've had the good times and I've had the bad times. And overall, it's been pretty good. Of course, there are exceptions to that. But uh, one of the things I get out of studying the life of Jacob is, boy, I had it good compared to this guy. He, uh, uh, real early as we read together, we'll see that, of course, he crosses his brother uh, Esau by getting both his birthright and his, uh, uh, and his blessings, and his brother's so angry with him that uh, he's, uh, he makes it known that as soon as his father dies, he's going to kill his brother. 
So his mother sends him up to uh, her brother, Laban, for uh, Jacob, it's Uncle Laban, as we would look at it, to get a wife. Because she doesn't like the, the, does not want her son to marry any of the Canaanite women. So he goes up there, and actually things start out pretty good. Uh, he goes up there, and later, later on, and we, we may not have time to cover it. When he leaves home, and, and later on time when he talks about how much God has blessed him, he just points out, when I crossed over to go to Laban, uh, I believe it was the river Euphrates, that all he had with him was a staff. And over the years, God tremendously blessed him, and he was a very rich man when he went back home. But anyway, uh, as, the circuit, uh, as events transpire, and we'll look at some of them, that uh, he gets a uh, uh, Laban lets him work for him as a shepherd. Uh, Rachel, uh, Jacob falls in love with uh, Laban's younger daughter, Rachel, and wants to marry her. Of course, he has no, uh, nothing to offer Laban, which was uh, part of the culture of that time. And so uh, they make a deal where he'll work for Laban for 14 years, or seven years, excuse me, to get Rachel. And uh, he's very much in love with her, and that, that starts out good. And uh, then there, we'll see about a struggle between Rachel and Leah as poor Rachel. The only thing Jacob wanted was one wife, Rachel. And the way things worked out, he wound up with four, of which he did not choose. <laughs> he just wanted one. And we'll look at the details of that later. And then there's the rape of his daughter, Dinah. And uh, he did have a daughter. We don't usually hear much about her, but uh, uh, Dinah was raped, and two of the sons uh, were, were going to get revenge for her, and they killed the, the man that... Uh, and by the way, the man wanted to make it right and marry Dinah, but uh, we'll see about a little bit more of that as we go along. But uh, the two sons kill not only the father and the... The man who did the rape and the father, but killed a whole bunch of other innocent people that had absolutely nothing to do with it. Of course, Jacob's got to deal with all that. Uh, later on in life, Reuben's first son, uh, Jacob's first son, Reuben, goes to bed with uh, uh, Jacob's concubine, which almost brings up to mind uh, uh, the, the problem that they had in Corinth and 1 Corinthians. And then later on, his favorite son, his favorite son is because it's, it's Rachel's son. She had a childbearing problem. And uh, uh, it was later on in life that she had uh, Joseph, and he became the favorite son. Well, the brothers got jealous, and certainly Jacob and, his, and uh, even Joseph himself handled the whole situation poorly, but that's no reason to try to kill somebody. But anyway... Uh, you know the you know the story where uh, they were going to take him out. Uh, he was went out with them, tending the sheep, and they were going to kill him. And Ishmaelite uh, caravan comes by, and they wind up selling him for a slave, which for them they meant it for evil, but God turned it into something good. But the, uh, and and we usually we focus on Joseph as we read that account, but it was a terrible, really tr terrible tragedy to the old man in that. He took it so much worse than the brothers uh, ever realized he would. And certainly it would have been a tragedy to him at the time, but he never really got over it. When Joseph is down in, in uh, Egypt, he's trying to get, he don't know what all he's dealing with with his brothers and everything. He, want, he finds out that he's got a brother, Benjamin, and he wants the brothers to bring him down because he wants to meet Benjamin. And the brothers tried to talk him out of it because uh, uh, Benjamin is, is, is indeed so close, or Jacob is so close to, to the boy here again, Rachel's uh, son. By the way, she died because in, in the process, after the, after the birth, she died shortly thereof, result of the, of the childbirth. And uh, uh, when they come back and tell Jacob that we, we've got to bring uh, Benjamin down there, because the man who's going to give us all this food and take care of us and everything wants us to meet him. And uh, Jacob tells him, he says that, you know, you know what I went through, and I'm paraphrasing, with Joseph. 
He says, if anything would ever happen to this boy, he said, it would take me to my grave. So we see indeed all of this stuff, and I've, uh, of course, it, it was kind of an overseeing. Uh, we'll, we're going to go back and cover some of these things as we go through the class. And uh, of course, they, of course, they get brought out that what his sons would lie and, and, and cheat him that treat him that way just to just to get to the brother. But anyway, we see as as we look at this father, and, and uh, we'll see some more of the troubles he has with his wives. Uh, not that it's their fault; it's just the the social problems that he's dealing with. But anyway, that's a rough life. Uh, and uh, the difference between us and him is we can read about it and we can learn about it, but he's the one that went through it and felt it all. So anyway, we'll go ahead and start from the, go back to the beginning where uh, uh, God promising, uh, uh, you have uh, Esau and, and uh, uh, his, uh, his wife were not able to have children at this point, and they prayed him, pray to God, and God answers and says that they would have two children. And in uh, uh, Genesis 25, God speaking to, uh, to Rebekah says, two nations are in your womb, talking about the two children not yet born, and two people are within you and shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So, so now she knows about this before that uh, eventually the younger will save, uh, serve the, or the older will serve the younger. And one of the, w w as we look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God all through the Bible is always teaching lessons and all these different things that we read about even in historical parts. And one of the things we see that uh, in the promising when there are more than one child, just like with Abraham, uh, there was uh, the child of, of uh, Ishmael between him and Hagar. Well, that was, uh, Abraham and Sarah came up with that one. Uh, Isaac was the child of promise. But anyway, with all three men, the children of promise that God promised them, that he pointed out, and it was always the younger, would be the one that the promises would go through. And according to the culture, it went through the older um, one, another thing that uh, is easy to miss in the study of Jacob, but there's a lot of it there, and just what, what are the benefits of reading and studying the Bible on your own when you can take time to think and stop wherever you want and consider things, is there's a lot of uh, Hebrew culture that's in here that if you just read over it in a classroom situation like this, it's very easy to miss. And so much of, of the things that they lived with and we look at, and we like having four wives and things of that nature, it's, you know, it's so foreign. Then we have wives and concubines. And, uh, you want to know about a concubine? Try, try looking at the scholars. And you have one tell you this and one tell you that. And, uh, it can be very confusing, whereas you can actually see the real live parts of it in here as these people deal with it. And, uh, and so a lot of the things that are very, very different to us uh, uh, is, is brought out here. For example, I've, I've heard the expression as far as for a concubine that uh, something I was able to connect with that says, well, a concubine is like a second-hand wife. I mean, a second, second grade, second grade wife. Well, for some people, that makes sense. Second grade, she's either a wife or she's not. So it depends on where your mind is on some of these explanations. Some say, well, they just married them for sex. Well, it was a whole lot more than that. And the reason why I'm going through this much of an explanation is because we'll be dealing with this as we go through this. Uh, when a man had a concubine, whatever you, uh, you, you want to say the reason he married her, he is responsible to take care of her for the rest of her life, housing, food, uh, just everything that she needs. Socially, she does not have the standing that the wife has from a social student. But here again, this is culture. Uh, in dealing with all that, God deals with culture of, of, of people as we see throughout the Bible and as time goes on. It don't change a whole lot, but it does change some. Uh, the basics of it are, are pretty much the same. For example, we think of marriage as you, you, you get your uh, marriage license, you have a ceremony, you know, uh, when it's over I pronounce you man and wife, and pretty simple deal. 
Well, they had a three phase, two, two, two of them was very close, but they had a three phase part of marriage. First of all, the first part was the uh, betrothal, which the word betrothed just means to promise. But the word promise to, the, to them meant a whole lot more than it meant to us. And so from a basic standpoint, they were married, didn't live together, didn't have sex. He lived there and she lived there, but they were a promise and, and uh, uh, it would just depend on, on different uh, individuals, how much social interaction they had, probably a lot. But I want to remind you of, uh, 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 even bring it up to the time of Joseph and Mary. Joseph and Mary were betrothed. Joseph finds out that uh, Mary is pregnant and at that, at, at initially didn't understand that that was from God, that God, this was in God's working. So he cares for Mary and, and, and he's looking out for her and so he's going to quietly put her away, divorce her. Now my question is, how do you divorce somebody you're not married to, they're not living together, they never, she's never had sex, she's a virgin. And so, but I, I'm saying that to show their view of what marriage is. We don't look at marriage that way. We can understand the, the language of it, but dealing with it. Okay, so uh, anyway, the children are born. Uh, verse uh, 25, verse 20, chapter 25, verse 24 of Genesis. And when the days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, uh, and all his body like a hairy cloak. Pretty hairy guy. That's especially, that must be interesting for a child that small, but he, he, he maintained that feature uh, even later on in life. So they called his name Esau. Remember what Esau means? I you know you've studied all this before. Red, okay. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand uh, holding his Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. And uh, Isaac was 60 years old when he, when he bore them. Okay, the standard question. What does Jacob mean? That's the answer to answer. Supplanted, okay, that's correct. It can be uh, translated supplanter, which means to take a place of another. And usually through devious means. It also can be translated, in fact, if you have an ESV, you can look down at your little notes on the bottom there and it'll, you, you can read it for yourself. It also can be translated cheater. It can also be translated one who grabs the heel. Now, which indeed Esau did, but the funny part of it is that's also a, uh, scholars seem to think a uh, Hebrewism, which like a slang term that we use, you know, if you're kidding somebody, you're always just pulling your leg. Well, leg don't have anything to do with it. We understand the Hebrew, the, the, the slang term. Well, to, to, for one who grabs the heel, that's a, just a slang term, again, for calling him a cheater. So uh, that's a rough name to go through life with, but God took care of that later. And so, so, and so we have the two, the two sons. Uh, As you can tell, if you were here Wednesday, I don't do too good on judging time. Uh, so I'm going to move along a little faster. Uh, one of the things that uh, we know about Esau, he was, he was a hairy man. Not only was he a hairy man, but he was a rugged individual. Uh, he liked hunting, he was a real outdoorsman, whereas uh, Jacob was just, he uh, was a, the scriptures refer to him as a smooth man, he wasn't, he wasn't hairy, and he stayed around camp a lot, things of that nature, and, and as you go through and you read the interaction between the, the children and the parents, uh, Esau was daddy's favorite, and Jacob was mama's favorite. And so she's, uh, on one occasion Esau comes back from uh, uh, hunting, and he, he feels like he's, uh, uh, he's starving. He's got to have something to eat. Jacob had some red stew, uh, lentil stew, and uh, sold, sold it to him for his birthright. If you uh, come across the book, None of These Diseases, which a doctor wrote about a lot of the things that 
you read about that the men in the Bible had, and there was actually a condition, especially for a hairy man, uh, big and strong, muscular, they're, 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 some of them do have a condition where they need a lot of protein. So if he had been out for a few days hunting and he's come back, he really feels bad. That his hunger would be a lot stronger than what, our, what we usually think of hunger. Because he says, well, what good's my birthright if I, if, if I die? So, uh, and birthright's a huge thing. The firstborn uh, had a responsibility when he got a, first, a birthright. In other words, he wasn't, well, you're the first one, we're going to give you a double portion and all. Uh, there was, as you look at the culture of these people, these back in ancient times, I don't care if it's the Israelites or who it is, <clears throat> you'll see much of the culture is based in survival. And, uh, so, and, and taking care of the family and things of that nature. But anyway, one of the responsibilities of the firstborn is when dad dies, he takes care of mom. It's his responsibility. Plus, he, where dad was not kind of in charge of the general group family, where they, they pretty much all lived in the same, uh, same camp, uh, usually, uh, instead of it being the father, now it's, it's the firstborn. Plus, if there's any unwed uh, sisters, he is responsible. Somebody's got to take care of them, and that's part of his responsibility. Now, ultimately, uh, depends on how good or how bad a guy he is, how all that transpires. But most of them, you're looking out for your family. If that's what he was to do. For a woman to be without a man, kind of, we learn a lot about Hebrew culture. We may not think about it that way from the Islamic people today. You got to remember their basic culture between their ears to live with a with a. a religion like they do is based, it started in 600 uh, AD, 600 years after Christ. It goes way back. And so a lot of the family things that they did there, you could, you could see the uh, Islamic people doing because they've taken it to lengths that were never, uh, never God's people ever did as far as even dealing with the women. But uh, a, uh, as far as husband dies, what's a woman going to do? As far as how, how she gonna live, she can't go in town and get a job. Uh, it don't work that way, and, and so about the only thing they could do is maybe raise some crops and go into the uh, town and sell them things of that nature. A, a woman is at a huge disadvantage without a man, and so the older brother, the uh, took care of that. Uh, and I won't go into the blessing. I think most of you have stated this enough to where you're familiar with the with the blessing. Uh, one thing I do want to cover is uh, uh, when Jacob goes in to get the blessing, he deceives, uh, deceives, his, deceives him, outright lies to him. Uh, Jacob had, uh, Esau had sent Jacob out to go get him some, uh, some barbecue you know, for the sake of uh, discussion on what he wanted, get, go out and get some deer and hunt it and come home and cook it, and, and uh, that was Jacob's favorite. And while he was gone, uh, mom, mom got with her, with her son, uh, Rebecca, got with uh, Jacob. And, uh, and they carried this uh, thing into where they were going to make Jacob, or Esau, think that he was giving the blessing to, uh, uh, Jacob was giving it to Esau. And that, well, he was going to give the blessing back when, when, he, when uh, Esau brought the food back from the hunt. But anyway, uh, mom kills a, kills a goat. A couple goats, actually, is what it says. And she, she, she does the barbecue, and so uh, Jacob disguises himself, which he does, isn't hard to do because the old man's blind, besides being all crippled up. And uh, so he brings the food in and gives it to him. And um, uh, Jacob asks him, he says, is, uh, who is it? And he identifies himself as uh, Esau. And he says, well, the smell is, is, is like Esau. He says, but the voice is, of J is Jacob. So he's suspicious right off the bat. Well, mom, mom pretty well knew this was coming, so she got some, some uh, uh, goat skin and put it on the backs of uh, Jacob's hand and a smooth part of his neck. Uh, and, and indeed, Jacob did feel. Now, one of the pictures I used to get years and years ago, before, uh, before, it had, uh, before I'd done much study on it, I always pictured uh, Rebecca went out cut up a piece of uh, goat skin and tied it on to, the old, to uh, uh, Jacob's hands, piece of, maybe put a piece around his neck, 
And that's what Jacob reaches out and felt. And that could be possible. That's certainly a possibility. But uh, I don't know how many of you are hunters. Uh, but are you familiar with uh, uh, tanning, of hi tanning of deer hide? Well, well, any hide, usually it's deer, but brain, brain tanning. Anybody familiar with that term? Okay, well, it's, it's, uh, even, the American Indians even use that. And these people here were adv much advanced at this stage than what the American Indians were when, when the white man got here. The American Indians didn't even have metal or, or uh, the wheel. But anyway, they had, they, they had natural means of tanning hide. One of the things you do just, uh, is, you, is uh, if you're going to use it for any kind of clothing, in, uh, clothing side outer clothing, you've got to get the hair off. Soak it, stretch it on a frame, and you scrape the, uh, uh, the hide off. I say all that to say it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not a pure skin on the, that, that, that he felt where all the hair was gone, or it was a real hairy thing that nobody feels that way. I don't care how hairy he is. And so, but what a poor scrape job would produce is skin with a lot of hair on it. The worse the, the, worse the scrape job, the more hair it's got. So uh, uh, Rebecca could have done a pretty good job of, uh, of uh, fooling, the, uh, fooling the old man as far as when he reached out and felt that hand. So Rachel, uh, so anyway, they, uh, the old man gets fooled. Jacob's got the, the, uh, the uh, double portion and the, and the blessing. And he comes home and, and he brings in the barbecue and all this stuff to his dad and uh, uh, all this stuff comes out. And uh, as you would uh, re uh, recognize that Esau was really angry. He was so angry that he decided when his uh, father died, he was gonna kill his brother. And that would take care of the blessing and the uh, birthright as far as uh, Esau was concerned. So uh, mom gets wind of this and she tells Jacob, you need to go to my, my brother uh, Laban and get a wife don't like these Canaanite women, do not want you uh, uh, marrying a Canaanite woman. And uh, when he, Esau, uh, uh, when he finds out about that he's going up uh, to do that, he goes out and he marries a descendant of Ishmael, Jacob's son, uh, Abraham's son, because he, know, he wants to please mom and dad, but that's, that's a side issue. But anyway, so he goes up there, and uh, uh, God guides him, tells him he'll be with him. And uh, on his way to, to Laban's, uh, he stops at a place, and he has a dream. And there's a ladder, and as he's looking at the ladder, he, there's the uh, angels are ascending and descending. And there's a classical... Renaissance painting of that. Jake, Jacob is laying on his back and he's got his hand up and there's a big ladder in the back and here's these, and this has always amazed me, here's these angels with, with wings climbing up and down a ladder. And I, I tried to, why are you climbing with a ladder with wings? But, uh, they, missed, they were excellent artists, very poor with the scriptures. And let me suggest that you cannot find anywhere in the scriptures where angels have wings. Cherubim, seraphim, these creatures all have wings, but if you can find a scripture where an angel has wings, where he doesn't just look like another person, sometimes they, they are mis, uh, uh, they don't, uh, they're not recognized as angels. Uh, if you can find a scripture like that after, after class or any time, uh, I, would, I would like you to show that to me. Um, so anyway, uh, in, in that dream, God says, I am, that's... Uh, chapter 28, and I'm starting to read from verse 13. I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and, and the God of Isaac. The land which you, which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring, and the offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And as I continue to read this, you'll see that it's pretty much he's passing on the, the, the uh, promise that he made, the contract between Abraham and Isaac. Now he's passing it on to Jacob. But anyway, uh, you'll be as the dust of the earth and shall be a breast spread abroad from the west and from the east and the north and to the south. And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to, to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. 
And uh, then J uh, Jacob awoke from the dream, and he has some other things to say. And I want to drop down, same chapter, drop down to uh, verse 20. And so God makes a, does his side of the vow. He says, if God will be with me, now listen what he's asking of God. And when I talk, talk, talk about cultures, the, the, uh, the primary focal point is, is uh, survival. You can hear it in what he's asking for. If God will be with me and will keep me this day, that I go and will give me bread to eat, clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone shall be set up for a pillar, uh, and shall be, uh, shall be God's house, and, and all that you give me, I will give, give you 10%. So we see how basic in this what he's asking for. And I wonder what we ask for and what we expect of God as far as, uh, as, as we look at God. And, and, and indeed, even from a, uh, it's hard to compare where we are culturally and where those people were and what they had to deal with. But anyway, uh, we get to see there that the passing on of the promise that all Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all got. And so in chapter 29, uh, Jacob goes in and, and he goes to where uh, Laban is. And uh, he goes to this well and there's some shepherds there. Uh, and they roll the, the stone back and they feed uh, and, and where they give their animals water. And while he's there, he asks one of the shepherds, if, uh, uh, do you know Laban, uh, son of Nahor? And he said, yeah, we know him. And so they get in a little discussion there, and, and he's looking, and, and, and uh, Jacob wants to find him, and he says, well, here comes his daughter now. And so she is, she is a shepherdess. Now pause just a second to look at it, shepherds. As, as people of the book, we kind of elevate what shepherds were. Just like uh, when I was a boy, and they had all these cowboy uh, shows back, they can't do, make shows like they did anymore like that. But anyway, no, too, too politically incorrect. Uh, uh, back then, cowboys were just big. Man, if you were a cowboy, man, that was something. Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and all these guys. Wow. In, in actual fact, in, in, uh, uh, in the American West, a cowboy was a laborer on a cattle ranch, a common laborer. That's what he was. So, uh, uh, and... Uh, they, they did a lot. There was a, li a lot of things they did, they, uh, that they were able to do, and uh, that a little bit of it they showed in the movie. But anyway, that's kind of what they did, you know, uh, with, uh, with shepherds. And if, if it was a big enough herd, then you need somebody who really knew what he was doing. But we see here is, here is, a, is a young woman. Uh, she's a shepherd. David, his brothers were out to war, and he was, he was being a shepherd boy. Well, he wasn't old enough. Here again, in, in the Hebrew culture, you were not a man until you were 20. And of course, he was still a teenager at this point, so he's out there. So I said all that to say, being a shepherd was certainly an honorable job. It was just very menial. It was a very menial job. It was kind of these, well, anybody can do that kind of job. And you did want somebody trustworthy. He would do his job and all that. Uh, uh, one of the things I found helpful to me I can't find it written in the scriptures anywhere, but do a little bit of reading up on uh, Hebrew, culture, <clears throat> Hebrew culture. And like I said, a, a, a boy wasn't a man until he was 20. And as you look at, at when they, uh, in the numbering in the scriptures, those who were 20 and up, because they were, they were able to be the fighters, the warriors. And you weren't a warrior until you were, until you were grown. Jesus did not become a teacher until he was 30. Now, God could work in any way he wants, culture, no culture, it's all beside the point. But he chose 30. And in the Hebrew culture, as a teacher, you would not be listened to until you were 30. Now, 30 is halfway. Uh, 40, you become an older man once you reach 40. Now, these are the older men. So, if uh, uh, when it talks about uh, Timothy being a young man, I've heard people say, oh, yeah, why didn't Timothy was a teenager. No, he wasn't, because nobody wouldn't listen to him. Now, if he could run around and do miracles like Jesus, probably, I, I would, that would certainly get my attention. But as culturally speaking, 
the age is wrong. So when I refer to uh, uh, Timothy as a young man, he could have been in his mid-30s, easy. Uh, and for them, that's a young man. So uh, I hope that's helped them. Uh, in, in bringing out some of this stuff, it's not all Jacob. And, and most of you, this is probably just all review stuff. Maybe a few, uh, it might be new. But I'll, I'm also going, I, I am going out of my way to try to bring out the culture and an understanding of, of understanding these people. I don't care what the culture is, people are people. And the same basics of what generates people, family, love, hate, emotions, all these things that you and I deal with has for, been from, uh, just uh, look at Adam and Eve in the garden. So much of what they dealt with, we, we deal with on a different level, but the same basics. But anyway, uh, people are basically people, and the culture is what looks different because of, of what they do is, and, and how they're approaching what they're doing to survive. That's what you and I are doing. We're trying to survive. And we're even make, we're making a plan and, and preparation for the time when we get put in a grave that there's only one way out of that grave, and that's Jesus and his blood. And so we're even making preparation for the future there, aren't we? Um, so uh, anyway, uh, God, uh, uh, Jacob here as we, at the end of uh, chapter 28. Um, uh, makes his promise to God. And I'm going to have to do some shortcut here on because uh, I want to deal with, especially want to deal with the marriage of Rachel, uh, of uh, Jacob, with uh, Leah and Rachel. Of course, uh, Jacob works seven years, as agreed to, to Laban, to get Rachel. And at the end of the seven years, he marries her. Uh, and, and as you see, the three parts of the marriage, remember I said earlier, you, you have a, a betrothal, you have the ceremony, and then they, they sleep together. The, the sleeping together does not make the marriage. It cu uh, culminates the marriage. It's the completion. It's every, all the three parts come together, and now they are married. And uh, uh, poor Jacob was a little bit of a cheater, but boy, he got his share of cheats in his life, too. Of course, you're familiar with, uh, he thought he was getting uh, Rachel and wound up in the morning. It was with Leah. <clears throat> and if you read a little, if, if uh, I don't know how much you are into camping and stuff like that, but we don't know what it is to be dark. When you can go out in the woods somewhere and there's no, there's no, uh, there's no moon, there's just nothing, and be able to go like this and you can't see your hand, that's dark. And you've got two sisters and they could be totally different. I don't know what they look like. Uh, uh, the only thing we're told about them is, is uh, Leah was uh, tender-eyed. Uh, depending on your translation, be soft-eyed. And I know some of the explanations of that. I found three. Well, what does that mean? One is she had eye trouble. Another means she had pretty eyes. And then here again, we get into a Hebrewism. Is she was so ugly, she made your, made your eyes hurt when you looked at her. And now, and what it talks, <laughs> and what it talks about with... Um, with Rachel, when it said that, uh, when it describes Rachel, not only was she pretty, but she was well formed. So Rachel indeed was a beautiful woman. Now here again, I don't know that you know. In the dark, you can't see something wrong with the eyes. Uh, they could have, if they're the same height. I got of, of my three sons. I had two sons that sounded so much alike on the phone that even people who knew them couldn't identify which one was which. Uh, Judy and I were about it, and not only did they sound the same, but they even uh, uh, talked about things the same way. Uh, Stephen and Michael. Uh, but anyway, uh, and so how similar they were in, in a very dark, and I'm not sure what all they had to drink at the party either. And uh, so that could have made a difference, and they certainly had alcoholic beverages then too. And uh, so there's all kinds of things why you can explain how he got tricked. But anyway, uh, he goes and he complains to Laban. Laban says that, well, you know, uh, work another seven years and I'll give you Rachel, but just wait, let, uh, fulfill Laban's week and then you can, you can have Rachel. So although he had to work 14 years to get her, uh, after the first seven, 
he, uh, he, uh, he, he did get her. And just real quickly, I want you to see the struggle uh, between Leah and uh, Rachel. And uh, Leah was the first one to have a child. And she named her son Reuben. See, a son. And she knew she wasn't loved as much as Rachel. And, uh, uh, and so she was thrilled to death that she got a son because that was huge back then. But anyway, she prays again. And, and her second one is Simon, which means heard, uh, as in hearing, God heard me. Levi attached. Boy, she's got three sons now. Jacob's going to be attached to her. And Judah is praise, means praise. And so uh, uh, Judah, uh, Leah had a lot of praise for God that he was being so kind to her. Well, Rachel's lo uh, looking at this and her heart's breaking because she, has she has, hasn't given any children uh, to, to, uh, uh, to Jacob. And uh, so she gets her handmaiden, has Jacob go into her. That wasn't Jacob's idea. His, his idea wasn't Re Leah either. But there he's stuck with them. And uh, so he does the cultural thing. This isn't something that uh, somebody pulled out of the air. Well, gee, I wonder how this would work. This was the culture of the day. It was common. This is what was done. And so to have a child that she couldn't have, she had it through her, uh, through her handmaiden, which was a slave. Uh, by the way, Laban was the one that gave the slaves uh, to, uh, to his daughters. He gave uh, Zilpah to Leah. And uh, Bill, uh, Zilpha, rather, and Bill Hill to, uh, to Leah. But anyway, uh, my time is spent. They're going to need time to get this stuff out of the way. So my apologies for, for the time issues. As, uh, we could, certainly would have liked to cover more about Jacob than we did. But I hope I've opened up some areas as far as the culture. And when you go through and you read these things for yourself, look for the culture. Because it will explain a lot about they, on how they do. Uh, Dan will be back next week and hope to see you all back then. Thank you for your time.